Hey, welcome everyone. I think we're going to get started. Thank you so much for being here. Great. I'm so honored to be here with you all this whole week um, and to kick off this morning panel. Uh, we've all actually just met for the most part and excited that we've been grouped together um, and hopefully some really clear themes will come through. But during the Q&A and kind of after our short presentations, please help us think through like what are the patterns, what are the themes uh, that we're all finding. Um, but we will be talking about kind of urban uh, manage retreat and equity and justice issues in particular. So those are some of the core themes for today. Okay, I'm going to get started on my end. So to those who I don't know, I'm Melissa Tier. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. Um, and I'm also currently a visiting re researcher with the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, um, YASA in Austria. Um, and I'll be sharing the project that um, I'm working on while in Austria um, that has really developed quite a bit in recent months, um, thanks to my colleagues there. So I'm going to walk you through that. Um, but first, to start with some literature, but we're not clicking. Okay, we'll try that. Um, so a theme that we've already been hearing a lot this week and I think is really key as we talk about managed retreat um, is that although a lot uh, of the framing has been around risk management, we know that this is really integrally tied to housing policy. Um, and that's where I want to start with today and it's gonna be the basis for the project that I'm gonna share. Um, and actually Kevin's here today and um, I, I just really love this quote. I think it's very eloquent from him and a colleague and I'll read it. Um, Urban housing has been the space and symbol of racial segregation, which continues to drive enduring inequities in home ownership, wealth, environmental exposure and neighborhood social conditions. Um, so when we talk about managed retreat and when we talk about it as housing policy, it's also of course, intricately tied to um, these inequities, long-standing inequities, um, definitely in the US, but in, in places around the world as well. Um, and there's research demonstrating this. Um, so this is uh, the, the paper I've just uh, put on the screen there um, is showing uh, a large-scale study of US buyouts, FEMA buyouts in particular, um, looking at the types of social vulnerability that might be showing up um, with buyout programs. Um, and I Joel might be in the audience, I think. Um, here's a, a great paper um, uh, related to the presentation we heard yesterday afternoon, um, looking at you know what what are models for successful managed retreat? What are normative models um, for transformative change? And trying to um, categorize some of that. So I'm going to return to that a little bit later. But I think these are these are the concepts that I've been thinking about a lot um, in my studies and research. Um, so with those in mind, um, with some colleagues, we ran a pilot uh, survey um, looking, trying to supplement existing qualitative case study research on buyouts with large scale quantitative survey data. Um, and so the, the core question was what possible features of a U.S. buyout program might be more or less popular um, in the policy, policy design process? And keep in mind, this was just a pilot, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about where it's gone since then. Um, but so it was for for survey research, it was relatively small um, and it was local to this area uh, and sort of the New York City metropolitan area and Philly as well. Um, and it was really interesting. So we we ended up getting from this pilot, we ended up getting null results. Um, so there were no strong preferences among our respondents who some had experienced flooding, some hadn't. Very, very few had any experience with buyouts in particular, and that was intentional. Um, and so despite kind of among practitioners, we talk about buyouts being very contentious, there's really very low interest among the participants who, um, who took this survey. And so that was telling and helpful um, to show that like, the general public might not have strong preferences about um, these types of policies, despite our strong interest and despite their likely interest if it came up for them. But there's just not a lot of, uh, until that is a lived experience, um, it's really technocratic, right, until that point and even after that point. Um, so what can we do with that and how can we use surveys to kind of acknowledge all of that? So we've shifted our survey after the pilot to instead of focusing on very specific bio policy preferences, to try to look at what are some of the underlying core values related to justice that might influence preferences down the line um, as flooding becomes more severe in an area, let's say. 
Um, and to that end, we kind of return to the literature, return to some of these categorizations of climate justice and, and are drawing on a couple of different ones. So the first um, coming from some of my colleagues at YASA is this recent development of a risk justice framework. Um, and you can, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but you can see it on the screen and take a look at it. Um, they divide risk justice into two different dimensions. The first is kind of the risk itself um, categorized into procedural, distributive, and corrective justice. And the other is the justice goals that fall under sustainable development. Um, and they, they identify four different components there, social, ecological, spatial, and temporal. And so we use that in our survey going forward. And then the other typology that I think is important is not just the justice aspects, but what are the actual clim urban climate adaptation strategies that come into play that buyouts are just one component of, and not even manage retreat is just one component of. Um, so for that categorization, we draw on the IPC, most recent IPCC report. Um, some of you, I'm sure, are familiar um, with these types of categorizations of adaptation as protection, accommodation, advancement, retreat, and so on. Um, and of course, you know, uh, within retreat, within planned relocation, um, there are many different steps and processes along the way. So just trying to give you a sense um, of the type of kind of layered categorization um, that we're finding helpful in this project. Okay, so the current work then um, is shifting that original question, which was focused on only on buyouts, and now looking a little bit more broadly at flood resilient housing policy and trying to get at these underlying justice values. Um, so the survey that we have not run yet, but will be running soon, um, is going to look at online respondents in five different cities globally, and I'll, I'll talk about the cities in a bit, um, and then compare and contrast both uh, between the cities and then sub uh, categories, demographic categories within each city, and then use those typologies that I was walking through before. Okay, so the main part of the survey, this is for the social scientists in the room, um, it's using something called a conjoint analysis, um, which is a policy uh, a list preference tool that comes out of marketing, and I'll just explain it really quickly. So um, you present uh, two different uh, packages or products or ideas to participants, um, show them side by side, and then typically ask them to, to choose between them in some way. So like I said, this comes out of marketing. So you could think about it. The example I like to give is a, is like a, a soda product. It can have many, many different features. It could be a can, it could be a bottle, it could have different colors, all sorts of different things. Uh, and you might ask people, you know, overall, which product design and flavoring and so on do you prefer? Uh, and so um, policy researchers have, have increasingly used this to do the same thing, but with policy products um, that, are, that combine lots of features um, of a policy package. Um, so in a policy setting, the, what we're asking is how much would a given element, so, you know, imagine like color or size or whatever, right? How much would a given policy element increase or decrease general support for the overall package holding all else equal? Um, so this is uh, an example of the type of um, what we're showing, what we'll be showing participants in the survey. Um, so it has different features of that could exist in kind of housing focused flood policies, with a pretty holistic view on that. Um, and these features, let me see if this works. Yeah, these features here are randomized across participants. Um, and so as people are taking this, they see different combinations. And then afterwards, we use analysis to see which elements kind of rise to the fore um, as most popular. And then we can look at that among different demographics. Um, so then going back to the typologies that I spoke to, what we've done is first started with literature um, and tried to come up with like, what are many of the common uh, policy features um, in this domain and, and try to list as many of them as possible. So this is just showing you a few of the categories and types. Um, there are there are many more that kind of are part of the options that can get randomized for participants. And then we've coded that um, based on the typologies that I showed you before. Um, so the different um, climate adaptation strategies and then the different justice types as well. And now we're going through a process of making sure we have representation of different types of justice so that when we do the analysis, we can really say based on these codings, what are the more, um, what types of justice are more interesting to different populations, right? Um, 
Okay, so I've talked about this conjoint task being, that's the main outcome variable for this survey, um, but there are a few others. Um, so the conjoints are focused on particularly distributive and procedural justice options, um, but we've also added some questions later in the survey that ask a more, looking more at um, corrective justice. Um, and so you can see, hopefully you can read that, but see an example on the screen there of one of those questions. Um, uh, my work comes out of behavioral science research, so we've also added a number of kind of common psychological questions, um, as well as some key political en engagement questions, um, re again, related to these policies. So those are dependent variables, our core independent variables, so what we're controlling for in our population that we're studying um, is, of course, like which city they're coming from out of the five that I'll describe, a number of key demographics, and then also whether they've actually experienced, you know, climate disasters and extreme weather experience or not. Um, so the cities themselves, um, we went through a criteria process to identify um, cities with a, a real geographic range, as well as you can see a number of other features that we were looking for um, on the screen there. So large cities, um, kind of global cities um, with, of course, experiencing flood risk, since that is our focus. Um, so the five here you can see on the screen. Um, if anyone is interested in talking later about kind of how to go through the process of designing a survey in, in multiple locations, I'd, I'd be happy to talk about that. But right now we're going through the process um, of translation. So it's both uh, cultural translations, working with colleagues to make sure the questions all make sense in every setting, um, but also uh, lang actual language translations. And that's a combination of using uh, AI translation and human translators as well. And then this survey, um, it's all going to be, it's all the same survey in different languages, but then run through different survey platforms, survey services in each city. Um, so those services you we can pay for, um, and they help identify participants based on um, uh, like demographic quotas um, for each of those locations. Um, so that's how a survey of this scale um, gets implemented uh, in different locations. Okay, I think I'm going to wrap up there. Um, some citations on the screen. I just want to say a really big thank you to my mentors and advisors who are supporting this project. Um, and I'm really interested if, in talking to any of you if you have advice or want to talk through this further. Thank you so much. And turning over to Tyler, please. Wonderful. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, uh, my name is Tyler. Sorry, I'm trying to navigate the, the mic. Uh, yes, thank you, Melissa. Um, my name is Tyler. Uh, I'm a master's student at Oregon State University. Uh, I study geography, but I also study applied ethics, which is basically trying to see how moral philosophy can inform what we do today. Uh, and so, yeah, today I just kind of wanted to talk to you all about some ideas that I've been thinking about recently. Um, and yeah, just be a part of a conversation with individuals who are doing really great work. So given the current and anticipated increase in the frequency and intensity of coastal flooding, among other coastal related hazards, communities across the United States have been forced to reconcile with managed retreat as a potential adaptive strategy for coping with growing risk a strategy that may soon become unavoidable for many. Now, despite efforts to resist and accommodate coastal risks through incremental adaptive strategies, many scholars have highlighted critical limitations to these approaches, one of which being that such measures may serve as short-term remedies that neglect and sometimes hinder addressing deeper rooted issues within a system, leading to latent risks and reinforcing existing power dynamics. In response to these criticisms, many scholars have looked towards deliberate transformative adaptation as a way to overcome the shortcomings of incremental responses. Deliberate transformative adaptation entails making fundamental changes that alter dominant social ecological relationships and contribute towards the creation of new futures. Such changes may take the form of institutional reforms, behavioral shifts, and cultural changes, along with technological innovations. Yet, 
many have stressed that in order for managed retreats to be positively transformative, it must bring about fundamental social, economic, and cultural shifts that address rather than reinforce present injustices. So in this presentation, I aim to engage in a meaningful conversation with scholars who are actively involved in the crucial task of defining the essence of just transformation in managed retreat. My objective is to provide you with valuable insights into critical aspects of justice and power that I consider to be at the core of this discussion. I aim to do this by proposing a framework for identifying injustices in managed retreat by focusing on how underlying elements of power condition adaptation decision-making processes and thus govern the transformative potential of communities facing coastal risk. I then consider how, how insights from deliberative theories of democracy open up potential avenues for combating coercive forms of power, conditioning what futures are possible. Since I'm speaking on the topic of social justice, I believe it is important to situate myself within a particular tradition of justice scholarship. Unlike many who consider the distribution of social environmental benefits and burdens to be the principal subject of justice, I'm instead concerned with the decision-making structures and procedures that reproduce distributive inequality, vulnerability, and restrict the capacity for people, both individually and collectively, to determine their futures. By concerning ourselves with the relationships that are produced within a particular institutional context, we can begin to explore what kinds of opportunities are enabled or constrained by existing social processes and for whom. While patterns of distribution are indispensable when considering questions of justice, it benefits us to explore how such patterns may be reproduced by existing relationships of power. Rather than conceiving of power as something that is willed by certain individuals over others, it might serve us well to think of power as relationships produced and reproduced, either intentionally or unintentionally, by processes of action. The structural basis of power is not a straightforward relationship between individuals who possess power and subject it over individuals or groups who don't. But rather, as Iris Marion Young suggests, one agent can have institutionalized power over another only if the actions of many third party agents support and execute the will of the powerful. Power, in this sense, is a product of a systemic network of relationships reinforced by processes of action that bring about certain social and material conditions. It is possible to be an agent of power, meaning to act in ways that reinforce relationships of oppression and domination without being directly affected or gaining personal advantages from them. The question then arises, how are these networked relationships reinforced by processes of action? One approach to power that may be valuable for answering this question is Brian Masumi's notion of operative logics. An operative logic is an underlying motivation driving the outcomes produced by a particular process. Operative logics do not cause processes to produce certain outcomes, but instead, they condition them towards certain tendencies of expression. The exact outcomes of a particular process may be unknown, but its operation is embedded with a particular logic or a set of rules that are more likely to produce certain kinds of outcomes rather than others. Think of an operative logic as a virtual boundary, govern governing what can potentially result from processes of action in a given system. Operative logics do not possess an inherent normative value, but instead should be judged based on the kinds of outcomes that they condition. For Masumi, the way that we empirically identify operative logics is by evaluating the tendencies of systems to observe the kinds of outcomes processes reproduce or do not produce at all. To exemplify how operative logics may be used to understand coastal adaptive governance, I will briefly discuss the city of Miami Beach, Florida. Due to its significant low-lying elevation, Miami Beach has devoted itself towards addressing its own risk to climate change impacts. 
fast tracking infrastructure projects that are meant to prepare the city for 30 to 50 years of coastal flooding induced by sea level rise. Resilient infrastructures have emerged in the form of industrial water pumps, seawalls meant to protect streets and properties, and raising over 100 miles of city streets, all of which are meant to thwart threats that growing sea level rise and coastal storms pose to the city's tourism and real estate economies. Relying heavily on property taxes to continue to fund resilience projects, Miami Beach, like many other coastal communities, has an embedded logic of economic growth and development associated with their processes of adaptation. While these projects have transformed technology and urban infrastructures, they often are meant to maintain the current social and economic systems in a given place. The dominance of economized operative logics in Miami Beach's processes of adaptive governance have conditioned the adoption of certain visions of future risk reduction over others. So, how is this notion of operative logics relevant to fostering just transformation and managed retreat? And how might we combat the dominant and coercive forms that they take? To understand whether just transformations are even possible for communities faced with growing coastal risk, we must attend to the dominant operative logics underpinning our processes of action and conditioning what outcomes and thus futures are possible. The capacity for managed retreat to operate as a successful vehicle for change for coastal communities depends on its capacity to not only address the physical conditions that shape risk, but also the elements of power that operate within and upon vulnerable communities, which reinforce existing injustices. I believe that deliberative theories of democracy provide us with insights on how to combat operative logics, limiting the transformative potential of communities. Deliberative theories suggest that we must cultivate a space for individuals affected by decision-making processes to, um, to obtain participatory parity, to create organizational procedures that allow for the exchange of experiences, needs, and concerns, while also granting those involved a co-producing role in developing solutions and strategies catered towards reducing individual and community experiences of risk. Through adopting more deliberative decision-making processes, we can decentralize dominant operative logics by empowering diverse experiences of the public meant to collaborate and co-produce alternative, alternative visions for the future. Thus, a central takeaway of this talk that I would like everybody to leave with is the willingness to ask, what is made possible or seemingly impossible within the kinds of institutions and procedures that exist today? Uh, here are some works that I have found relevant in this work and thank you all. Yeah, that's fine. And I don't need to see notes or anything. Okay. So, yeah. Thanks. Appreciate it. Hey, everyone. Um, timer or I'll go on forever. So we go. Uh, so, hey, I'm Siders. I'm A.R. Siders. I'm at the University of Delaware, right? I spent a lot of time thinking about buyouts, justice, how we do this uh, more justly and more fairly. And uh, I'm going to be a little depressing today, but I'm going to try to try to end on a good note. <clears throat> so one of the things is, right, uh, I'm a lawyer. More importantly, my mother's an English teacher. <laughs> so I spend a lot of time thinking about words <laughs> and the fact that words have meaning and that we often don't know what the heck that meaning is, but we use them anyway. Right. So any of you who have used vulnerability, resilience, all these, right, <clears throat> there are whole literatures on what the heck is resilience. Right. Cool. Not going to have that debate today. We're going to have a far more interesting one about what the heck is justice. <clears throat> yeah. And one of the things I think is fascinating is that I don't think we know. <clears throat> yeah. 
uh, and I don't think we know in any specific context, or more importantly, I think we each think we know, and we all disagree, but we don't talk about it with enough specificity to realize that we disagree. Okay? So one of the things I really want to talk about today is if you leave anything with this, it's that when you talk about justice, when you propose solutions for justice, when you say, hey, if we only did X, it would be more just, is to please think about what is the context that you are saying that in? What is it in your mental model that you are thinking about this applying for? Right. If you are thinking about a relocation and what is just, and you are imagining a historic community of color, right? You are thinking about something very different than if you are thinking about a white secondary beach vacation home town, right? Those are going to be very different. And what is just in those two contexts might be totally different. And so you need to question what is your mental model and what are other people's using? All right. With that takeaway, justice is a big word, uh, and we're not going to cover all of it in 10 minutes. So we're going to try to think about what does it mean in a very specific context, right? In a very specific context of managed treat, and what does it mean in a very specific context even of buyouts and buyouts in the United States, right? And the reason for this is this. There are practitioners of you in the room, right? I work with practitioners a lot who are running buyout programs, and a lot of times they really, really want to do something that is more equitable or more just, right? They want their program. They don't want their programs to replicate systems of injustice and inequity. They don't want their programs, right, to do something. Well, okay, if you sample a thousand buyout program administrators, the chances that some of them are racist assholes is like statistically not zero. <clears throat> but, but most of them, right, really want to do well. And the problem we have is that they don't know how to do better. And I have no evidence to tell them how to do better. And this is the problem. So I really want to tell them how to do better, right? Brief primer, I think most of you in the audience understand buyouts and how they work, right? So generally speaking, buyouts, there's a disaster, local government applies for funds. If they get the funds, they offer buyouts to the residents, the residents make decisions, and then the land is maintained as open space. I know there's an infinite number of exceptions and variations on each of those stages. You know that too. We won't go into that. There are also equity and justice implications at every single one of those stages, right? Whose homes are most affected? Which communities have been underserved and underprotected, have received underinvestment in their stormwater management and their protection that has made them be exposed in the first place, right? Which governments get funding from the local government, right? Which governments have capacity? Which local communities have that space? Which communities, when we say, oh, let's have it be community driven, which communities have the power to make their voice heard, to make their request for buyouts heard, right? Because, I mean, I love we're in New York City pointing out that seven communities asked for buyouts and two got them, right? So community driven also has an element of power in terms of who's getting it there. Where does the government make those decisions? We're gonna talk a lot about this one today, right? That's a big one. And then what influences homeowner decisions, right? At what point do personal demographics, what point is this truly a choice, right? We all talk about this being voluntary and we all put it in quotes, even if we don't <laughs> right, actually put it in quotes. We all have the sense that like, is it really voluntary? And this comes down to a long history of like, what does it mean to make choice, right? What does it mean to have a real choice? Um, and so there's a lot of question there about who actually has choices. And then, of course, there's equity and justice implications in terms of how the land is used, right? Uh, at least Evar's work on this is, is fantastic in terms of like, right, the communities that have more resources are more likely to do something useful for the community with the land that is open as opposed to communities that don't have resources to do that. So how does that land get used? Does it cause gentrification? Right, all kinds of interesting questions and dilemmas. Again, we're not going to try and get into all of it with eight minutes. <clears throat> But just a few things to think about, right? One of the big ones is uh, when you look statistically, there's a number of papers that have done this now about buyouts across the United States. You find that wealthier, denser counties, right, or administrators, local administrators tend to get more federal money for buyouts. It's kind of not surprising that if you think about it from a capacity standpoint, right, which towns have capacity to navigate right, the federal bureaucracy and get those funds who have time. Uh, I love talking with a practitioner from North Carolina. They mentioned they're working with a town where the local administrator is also the animal control officer. So in the immediate aftermath of a disaster, <clears throat> he's not applying to FEMA, right? He's chasing down snakes, which as someone who hates snakes, very much support that job, like very supportive, right? But they are not going to get as much funding for buyouts as someone else who's hired, right? Like I love New Jersey. They went and hired a whole bunch of FEMA grant officers to run their grant application process. Like way to understand the game, <laughs> way to play the game, right? On the other hand, why is it a game? <clears throat> so but where do you make those decisions? So people who, places that are denser and wealthier get more buyout money, and then they buy out homes in areas that are lower income and less dense, right? Rural areas. Okay, that's the pattern. <clears throat> Is that unjust? You're now a county administrator. You've now been given a million dollars to buy out homes. Will you offer them in the rich, dense part of the town and the county, or will you offer them in the lower income, less dense part of the town or the county? Yeah, I don't know either. 
and nor do they. And this is what I mean about I don't have the evidence to tell them what the right answer is in that scenario, right? And I suspect it's context dependent, but we don't even have enough evidence yet to say how the context would shape that decision. And so what you get is you get some practitioners who are like, absolutely, I am going to prioritize offering buyouts in lower income areas and in communities of color because these are places that have been underinvested in historically. These are places where we know that disasters are going to do more damage, where people have fewer resources to deal with the disaster when it does happen. They have fewer options to move on their own. They have, right, if they abandon their house, they're going to be financially devastated. So, of course, I'm going to give priority access to funds to an area that has not received priority access to funds in the past. Totally sensible, right? Then you go into other view other practitioners and they're like, absolutely not. Hell no, I'm not offering buyouts in that area. Right? Nope, absolutely not. Why? Because those communities, the reason that they are at risk is because we haven't protected them. Even offering the idea of a relocation might be structural violence, as DeVries et al. pointed out in their paper. Right? This might be a structural violence, especially if this is a community that lives where it does because it has been displaced in the past. So to even go in and talk about relocation might be cause problems, might cause additional trauma, might make the community feel like it's being abandoned or being forced out. Even if, even if it is technically voluntary, right? So even offering in this place. Moreover, people might have uh, inability to find replacement housing because if you're paying them a depressed home value, the ability of them to find additional housing nearby is reduced. And so they may effectually be displaced out of the community entirely. Practitioners feel so strongly about the camp that they are in that frequently they ask me to name the practitioners who are on the other side of this fence because they want to report them for malpractice. Yeah, they feel strongly enough about this. They're like, that is so unethical. How could they possibly be doing that? I'm like, well, I mean, I don't know if they're wrong, right? And, and this is the challenge. So anyone who thinks that there's like an easy answer to this question, I just, I just want to highlight this. Like there isn't, I think. And I think this is context dependent, as I said. But what I don't have enough right now is I don't have enough data to tell you in which context is which of these the right approach. And so this is where I think when we're talking about solutions, right, we really need to think about what is the context in which we are operating, in which one case or the other might make more sense. Then your county administrator, you have a million dollars, right? If you have a fixed budget, you also have a problem, to, a challenge to answer in terms of if I buy up lower income homes, I can buy more of them, right? Should I buy more homes or fewer homes? If I offer you relocation assistance and if I offer you additional support, then I can buy fewer homes. Now you might be better off in the long term, but I can help fewer families. So should I help more families? or give more support to fewer families, yeah? Now I know this sounds like I'm a lawyer playing case law like in a classroom, but this is an actual debate that, I'm, that I consistently have with practitioners. Like one practitioner I'm working with right now has a waiting list of 45 homes who want to be bought out. They've been waiting for some of them 15 years for funding, yeah? He recently received enough funding that he can buy out two or one, depending on how much support he gives to that family. So he now not only has to choose which of those 45 homes he's going to buy out, but which of those homes is like, like, should he offer it to the guy who's in a wheelchair? But the guy in the wheelchair can't buy another home that has a ramp and he can't provide enough funding to help the guy pay for the ramp at his new home. <sighs> Better to buy him out, the family with young kids. The young kids have PTSD from dealing with the past floods. It's a hard choice. And again, I don't have an answer for him. And the more I look at procedural and distributive and intergenerational and restorative and recognition justice, I still don't have an answer for him because we're still talking about these big grand theories and not about actual decisions that are being made. Of course, this is premised on the idea that the budget is fixed. So some of you might be thinking like, cool, let's get rid of that budget problem. Absolutely, we should definitely be getting people more money so that they don't have to make that choice. On the other hand, here's a question. Should we buy out this home? Just sold in the Hamptons for $150 million. Anyone think we should spend money buying out this home? Most practitioners don't. Most practitioners say, no, we shouldn't be buying out homes over a certain threshold. They disagree about where that threshold is. But this raises an interesting question, right? At what point are you so rich that you don't merit government assistance in keeping your family safe? I mean, that's the judgment call we're making, right? So that's an interesting question about justice. And it also says something about what do we think the role of these buyouts are? Are these buyouts something to which you have a right? Are these buyouts a welfare state program? as some practitioners describe them, are these buyouts something else? Because if you have a right to it, that right shouldn't stop depending on the expense of your home. It's a dilemma. So most programs functionally don't buy out this type of home, right? But it raises the question that even just raising your budget entirely doesn't necessarily get rid of these questions. <laughs> yeah, because you still have to wonder then like, who's this guy gonna sell to? And if you don't buy this out, do they just keep selling and keep redeveloping and keep 
putting people in this house. Maybe we're fine with that because they frankly can pay for it themselves. Personally, I'm kind of okay with it, but, but it raises an interesting question, right? How do we think about that? What is the need for it? Yeah. Um, I mentioned this like Bear River. I'm, it's not actually its name. <laughs> anyway, I, I'm not disclosing their name until I figure out some of the legalities of what's going on there. But, uh, but they're a town in the Midwest that I'm working with. And this is the town that's facing this problem, right? So they have these homes, 45 homes, waiting for money to be bought out. Which one do you buy out? Right. I find this one interesting too because there's a gaming, there's a gamification system in this one as well, in that they bought out 150 homes back in the early 90s. Yeah. As a result, they no longer get FEMA disaster declarations because there aren't enough homes, then the homes aren't worth enough to reach the dollar damage threshold to get a disaster declaration. Now, what should happen is a local and state government should provide assistance to those residents who still have three feet of mud in their homes, but who have not become a federally declared disaster. What actually happens is that they get nothing. Right? It's FEMA aid or nothing, which also raises this interesting question because some of the administrators look at me and they're like, you should not buy out the most damaged homes and the most at-risk homes because if you do, you will never get another disaster damage de declaration. What you should do is you should buy out the least damaged homes right, so that you continue to get a disaster declaration for as long as possible and only at the last minute do you buy out the most damaged homes. Now, mathematically, they're not wrong. Ethically, I have concerns, right? Uh, so there's some interesting questions in terms of how you gamify the system trying to get money. And then, of course, we all talk about people who don't want to move, and that's something we should be really concerned about. But we also should be thinking about the people who want to move, right? Because I uh, interviewed 36 practitioners. Every single one of them has a waiting list, right? So every single one of them has a waiting list, which now number in the thousands of people who want buyouts and aren't getting them. So there's also an injustice element of, like, we need to help people who want to stay, but also how do we give more support to those people who want to go? And a lot of it comes down to, some of us have, this is what I mean, like we, we tend to have an innate sense of things, and then, but we don't talk about it explicitly. Do you think a buyout is a harm or a benefit, right? Do you think this is the moving is something that is good for people or bad for people? And it's one to which we don't have much of an answer and that the answer probably is both, right? At the same time for the same people. And that there's so much uncertainty in this and that the uncertainty bars are so big that the benefit cost ratio analysis is meaningless. And I mean this both from like the financial calculation and from the more general sense, right? I think BCRs in this area are have such big uncertainty bars, right? If you have a ratio of 0.9 and an uncertainty of plus or minus 0.5, that is functionally no different from knowing nothing, <laughs> yeah? That, that is not useful. But we use that calculation all the time and we don't talk about the uncertainty bars. The uncertainty bars are here huge. Now think about this for a minute. You live in a floodplain, right? You're about to move. Okay. Think about how much your stress level will go down when you move. Think about how much you will miss your neighbors. Now, are you going to miss your neighbors? Is that more or less emotional damage than the amount of stress reduction relief you will get? I don't know for myself. I certainly don't know for you all on average, but that's the calculation we're asking practitioners to make all the time in order to say, do we think that this biode is a benefit or a harm? Because if it's a benefit, we should offer it to low income and communities of color, right? Because those are the communities that should be given the benefits. Distributive justice would say, give your benefits to people who have the least resources. If it is a harm, we should absolutely not give it to those same, not impose it on those same communities. Distributive justice doesn't tell us what to do if it is both a benefit and a harm at the same time. So what do we do about that, right? Because we have all these kinds of complications, you know, your emotional well-being, what kind of housing you move into. I mean, there's a huge literature on residential mobility and how, how mobility affects children versus adults differently, how it affects different, um, you know, income levels differently, all kinds of stuff going on here. And we just don't know enough. And we don't know enough about whether buyouts are just statistically different from the experiences of other people who experience residential mobility in other forms. So I actually don't know if the, res the references from all the residential mobility literature apply in this context, or if there's something unique about a buyout that, is, that means that there's a different outcome for them. All right, so yeah, what do we do if it's both? And what do we do if we don't know in advance, right? How do you design a policy where you don't know if the outcome will be harmful or beneficial or where the results might change? Right, one of my favorite interview quotes from Valmire, Illinois, is a woman who says like, oh, I really miss living near the river. On the other hand, every time it rains, I'm really glad I don't live near the river. Right, like, so even her own calculation of like, is she glad she moved? You know, did you did you interview her on a dry day or a wet day? Right, and if it changes over time, like, how do you how do you think about that? Right, evidence from Katrina relocation suggests that about three years after the relocation is when people hit their stride. They started recovering, they got some more stable housing, and they started having slightly better mental health outcomes. Well, the longest longitudinal bio study we have is three years later. So. So what does that look like, right? So we don't know yet. So, so over time, that'll be an interesting one as well. All right, some of you are thinking this, right? The answer is we let the community decide, and that's simple. 
This is my obligatory Star Wars reference. <laughs> right? It's not simple. It's actually really, really complicated. Because if you want to let the community decide, that's great. You now have to figure out who the community is. You have to decide what scale you're having that analysis. You have to decide how the community is going to decide. You have to decide how the community, right? And even if you decide not to, all you're doing is kicking the can down the road, right? Instead of me deciding, I'm going to let this section of the room decide, cool. But then like who I pick is going to pick, like, like define the community, right? If I tell you to define the community, you're going to define a different community than if I ask you to define the community. Yeah, so even that can be a challenge in terms of who is our community. And we can see this in places where the community made a decision, but the community was the landlords and not the tenants. Uh, should it be? I don't know. I have questions. How long have the tenants been there? <laughs> right? How long have the landlords been there? What kind of community is this? Like who, who is in the community? Who is not? Did the children get a vote? <laughs> Did the non-homeowners get a vote? Even a household deciding, right? There's gender norms and power dynamics in terms of even within a household making a decision is not a, a simple estimate. So. The community decision can be really important. Um, I love this quote from Rebecca Hersher's paper, 2019, right, where she interviews people who are pro and con buyouts because the community was told to decide whether or not they wanted buyouts. And so some residents say, you know, this place is worth fighting for. We absolutely shouldn't allow benefits. And the other person says, if you think that the historic towns in this place, right, you're a despicable person. And she had no bones about saying that and naming her neighbor on NPR, <laughs> right? Like, now, to be fair, her like son has PTSD. She had friends who died in that flood, right? She feels very strongly about this. Of course she does. So, I mean, and the title of that story is like the buyout offer that almost destroyed this town. So not even buyouts, right? Just having the conversation was so damaging. So this goes back to like why some practitioners are not willing to engage in the, even the conversation in some areas. So when we say the community should decide, great, but I hope you have a really detailed plan for figuring out who the community is, how they're going to decide, and how you're going to have that conversation without inducing further trauma. Because I think sometimes we say the community decides and then we stop the conversation, whereas in reality that has to be just the beginning of the main process. I'm almost done, I swear. And the last thing that we don't talk about enough is how we think about this at scale, right? Because uh, these are homes, for example, uh, I love picking on them in Florida. Um, I love picking on them enough that this is an actual Google screenshot of their house <clears throat> because the town like functionally abandoned that road along the waterway, as you can imagine, but they didn't legally abandon it. <clears throat> so developer went in, built those homes, new homes, right? Went in on that road. They sued because the road wasn't being maintained. They won. Yeah. And now the expense to maintain 1.5 miles of road to access those four new homes is worth more, costs more than the entire county's budget for road maintenance. Now, is that just? Now it it's, might be very just to say those homeowners, right? We talk a lot about those homeowners have a right to be in their home, they have a right to remain, right? If we say things like people have a right to remain, then do we mean that they have a right to remain or do we mean that some people have a right to remain, right? Some people who maybe had, didn't build their homes in 2019, yeah? So when we say right to remain, who do we really mean? Because I don't think we mean everyone. I actually don't think we mean them, <laughs> yeah? So, so let's be careful about when we say there's a right to something, who are we giving that right to? So we don't think about this enough at scale, right? Is that fair to them? Is it fair to the county? Like who should we be thinking about justice for when we think about that scale? Um, I also like picking on Dauphin, Alabama, all right? Because they've paid in $9 million in flood insurance money and gotten out 72 million plus an additional 80 million in disaster relief. They've rebuilt 16 times. Is that fair? <laughs> it's interesting, right? Again, do they have a right to remain? Um, and the last one is like, we do these screening tools, right? So this is the, and I'm not picking on, well, we can have a whole session where we pick on just this tool, but uh, this is the community economic justice screening tool, right? And I just want to point out, great, you've identified the most economic, you know, the environmental justice communities. Now, back to my first question, do you offer buyouts in those communities or not? Yeah, Oakwood Beach is highlighted in blue there, notably not a disadvantaged community. Does that mean we shouldn't have offered buyouts in that community? Or does that mean it was the right thing to do to offer buyouts in that community? This goes back to this question. We have the screening tool, we have more data, great. We know where the disadvantaged communities are. We still haven't solved the fundamental problem of what to do with that information. So we can build out all the screening tools we want, but if we don't tell people how to use that information, we're not actually going to improve the justice of their programs. So this is my last slide, right? It's complicated. Complicated doesn't mean we don't stop fighting for it. Like we want programs to be just, we need to make them more just, we have to do better. But doing that means we can't just stop at simplistic solutions like, oh, they just have to make a screening tool, or oh, they just have to think about it, or oh, they just have to engage the community. Like, those are lovely. They do not solve the problem. Yes, so we have to do better at providing more specific, more context-specific, more concrete suggestions than engage in the dilemmas that are actually being faced by practitioners if we want to improve these programs. 
Amartya Sen talks about justice is a, a question of dealing with the options that are actually on the table. And we need to do that. Or we need to dismantle the table. Those are our two options, right? And so either we need to get, provide really concrete advice within the system where people are working, or we need to give them the tools to dismantle that system and build something new, rather than engaging in magical thinking that we are going to somehow solve it within these constraints. And to do that, I think we can think a lot more about transformation, as we just heard, although that's not an easy answer itself, uh, and to be a lot more creative. Thanks, sorry for going over time. All right. Um, thanks, everyone, for having me. Uh, my name is Kevin Lochran. I'm an assistant professor of sociology at Temple University in Philadelphia, and um, want to acknowledge my co-authors, Jim Elliott and Jay Wang, who are watching on Zoom from Houston at Rice. Um, so this is an awesome uh, panel. Really excited to be part of this conversation um, and want to kind of talk about a little bit of the research we've been doing uh, focused on the FEMA's um, hazard mitigation grant program. And so that's going to be my main kind of point of reference when thinking about buyouts. So it's a it's a good segue from Cider's uh, talk, um, as well as kind of thinking about what does equity even look like? What does justice even look like? As Cider's mentioned, they're these very ambiguous concepts. And what do we do with them if we want to kind of actually do something? Um, because it seems like, you know, something I was just thinking about is if everyone's kind of for equity, why don't we have equity? Why don't we have justice if so many people are for it? Um, and so we're, you know, our team, we're researchers. So that's going to be kind of the thrust of this. But I hope that the stuff that I'm going to be talking about is of usefulness uh, to uh, activists and policymakers, practitioners as well. And our focus in our work is mostly on race and racism. And I would, again, in thinking about sort of definitional stuff, I would imagine that most, if not all of us, agree that race is central to any question of environmental equity and justice. So how can all of these people I just mentioned understand race in the context of managed retreat? And importantly, uh, what are the paths forward for research and practice? So there's two big problems. There's a lot of, there are, I'm sure there are a lot more, but there are two that kind of come up a lot in our work um, in terms of thinking about managed retreat as a sort of, as a program and kind of how we sort of struggle with it sort of on a political level as well as empirically and analytically. So it's, it, these things all kind of um, intersect. And so the first one that I wanna talk about is the idea that the federal managed retreat policy is colorblind. Um, and so for those who might not be familiar with that, idea, I have a, a definition from Eduardo Bonilla Silva on the screen, but basically in this context, it means that race doesn't directly factor into the cost benefit analyses that are used by policymakers, right? These buyout transactions are seen as economic transactions. They're seen as having a sort of an engineering or technocratic kind of component um, when in fact they have a deeply racialized basis, right? And so um, in Bonilla Silva's definition here, I highlighted or underlined market dynamics, right? So this idea that if you see racially unequal outcomes in buyouts, well, it's not the fault of the policymakers. It's not the fault of the technocrats and the planners. It's market dynamics. This isn't their fault. This is just something that's sort of pre-existing in the ether. It doesn't have to do with race per se. So this is a problem. The second problem, and it's related to the first one, I think, is that the federal managed retreat policy focuses on homeowners, right? So this is a group that is very heterogeneous, right? I don't want to suggest that this is a uniformly wealthy, um, you know, uber privileged group of uh, political actors, but they do have relative legal and economic privilege relative to people who don't own homes, right? Um, and that privilege was built historically and in the present by racially unequal access to home ownership. So this is this is a problem in our sort of estimation. It's a problem for analysis because 
as researchers, we often have to follow the policy. And if the policy is focused on homeowners, it becomes very challenging to talk about non-homeowners in this context because there's not really a lot of data. We would have to go collect that data ourselves. That's time consuming, that's expensive, that's difficult. So there's a there's a sort of a disconnect there that, um, you know, are we as researchers reproducing this bias like by, by sort of doing our analysis on homeowners as well? And so for us, um, both problems occlude the, pro the power of whiteness in this, in this assessment, right? Because as our research has shown, it's white communities who are really benefiting from managed retreat um, by and large. So what can researchers do? What can we do to try to um, work against some of these problems? So one thing is to investigate and document the inequities that might result from them. So what are the consequences of colorblindness in policy? What are the consequences of a focus on homeownership? So we know that history matters, right? I'm sure everyone in the room is familiar with the sort of uh, the historical construction of racially unequal and segregated housing in the US. But I think if we want to sort of say that managed retreat is exacerbating these problems, we sort of need to empirically show how that's happening, right? That it's contributing to new racial inequities. So how can researchers do that? So from that first problem, it kind of presents this challenge as I was alluding to. So colorblind policies mean that individual racial demographic data don't exist for nationwide assessments of federal retreat policy. So I imagine there are uh, folks in this room who have worked with the, uh, the, the, na the national data set that FEMA was compelled to release by NPR back in 2019. Um, that does not have any information about the racial demographics of the people who took the buyouts. So how do we find out the racial identity of the people who are involved in this program, right? So case study research can obtain some of this data at a local level, right, by doing interviews or surveys or ethnography. But this tends to kind of uh, reproduce a scalar and methodological divide in a lot of this work, right, where it's sort of like the case studies tend to be qualitative, the macro analysis tends to be quantitative, and it becomes challenging to generalize, right? So if you're finding a particularly racialized outcome in one case study, and there's a different racialized outcome in a different case study, how do we kind of draw general conclusions when we're talking about the federal policy? It's very challenging. Um, and the lack of racial data makes that challenging. So what are some solutions? Here's some things that um, our team has tried to work through. They're definitely not the only solutions, um, but there's stuff that I hope could be some, some useful things to think about in your own work. So the first one is to study racialized communities, not individuals. So rather than sort of wanting to necessarily know the racial identity of everyone who's in the buyout program, let's look at the communities where these have happened and study the racial composition of those communities. Let's also put those retreating homeowners in motion. Let's study racialized communities over time in addition to that geographic space. And so why would we want to do that? Part of it is because for me as a sociologist, right, the production of race is a long historical process. It's not something that we can just sort of parachute in in the present day and think that we can totally understand the picture of what's happening racially in any given community. So we need to kind of look at this over time. We need to think about how buyouts intersect into that historical process over time. We want to avoid static ahistorical understandings of race. Um, which are, you know, I think, unfortunately, quite common. We want to go beyond race as a mere variable in this research. What does that look like? So here's an example from um, our a paper we published in Social Currents, um, where we were looking at Houston and Harris County, Texas, as a case study, and we were interested in sort of where buyouts had happened, right? So this was data that we initially received from the Harris County Flood Control District with their FEMA-funded FEMA uh, property buyouts between 2000 and 2017. And if you just looked at the racial, the community racial demographics in 2000, which is about when the uh, the program started locally, um, and especially after 2001's uh, Tropical Storm Allison, what you would find is that there's no statistically significant relationship in terms of race, in terms of the race of the communities. But if you start to look historically and say, well, who's been living in these communities? How have these communities been changing in terms of their racial demographics? You find something quite interesting, which is that it's the communities where there had been white flight in previous decades that you're seeing more buyouts. So there's something going on that wouldn't necessarily be immediately apparent 
if you weren't taking a more historical view and thinking about how this uh, racial production of these buyout communities is happening um, over a longer historical time period, even before buyouts even happened, right? Even before there was significant flooding in these communities in some cases. And you can do this at the nationwide scale as well, right? We can start to think about how time becomes in it as this, especially as this policy changes, right? So for those who are familiar with the policy, this was started in 1985 and was largely a rural program focused on the Mississippi watershed. But as our, you know, this is this is not an overly complicated thing to find here, but that increasingly it's an urban program, right? So that's it's a it's a program that was built for one social context that is now becoming increasingly used in a very different kind of social context, right? A rural farming community in Iowa is very different from New York City. So as this becomes more of an urban program, it's encountering those sort of uh, accumulated racial uh, uh, forms of segregation that we all um, are very interested in combating in this room. So I mentioned putting retreating homeowners in motion as another sort of way to think about how we might get into, again, this, there's not individual racial data, but we wanna talk about race, let's talk about communities. And, in, and as a sociologist, I think there's something that might even be you know, uh, beneficial about that from a sort of thinking about these racialized urban systems um, to really focus on the, at the community level. So when we can do, one thing we can do in um, trying to get new forms of data into this question, because again, there's this lack of data that's out there, is that we can look at where people have moved, which is not that, I'll say that's not, it's not that complicated. It takes effort and time, but it's not that hard to find where a lot of people have relocated after um, taking buyouts. And so this is um, some, uh, this isn't the, the, the most attractive way to present this, so I apologize. But basically what this is showing is that um, these are the sort of the, the, the census tract traits of communities where buyouts have happened and, and where people took the buyouts compared to the, the tracks where they ended up after they relocated. And what you'll see here, and I don't know if this, does this have like a, if I do this? Oh, there we go. Okay, sweet. Um, so you'll see like percentage white. So on average in Houston and Harris County, people were moving out of a, a track that was 44% white, moving into a track that's 59% white. So they're moving into a space that's 34% whiter than the one they left. They're making a similar, uh, shift in terms of moving into areas with higher income per capita, as well as areas with higher uh, median value of owned housing units, right? So they're making this shift as they take buyouts. What does that mean, right? This is a real question when we're thinking about the sort of reshuffling of people in urban systems that is sort of put in motion by buyouts. What does it mean for these white communities to become whiter or for people to leave these communities and sort of um, sort of buttress the existing white communities within a city and a region? And had to have a map on here to sort of give you um, sort of a sense of this, what this looks like spatially. So this is in Somerset County in New Jersey. And so um, we can certainly talk about this, but I think a big takeaway here, this is showing a census tract that is predominantly white. And most of the, I think 90% of these people are moving into other predominantly white census tracts. So something to really be aware of when we think about um, race in this setting. Um, last, point here is sort of the second challenge. And this is, I think, a sort of a more overarching thing. But the really the key for me when I think about a lot of the literature in this field is to not only locate race, but whiteness, right? Because this is obviously the dominant racial category. But as um, Alistair Bonnet calls it, it's an overarching and unplaceable norm. It's not often named in a lot of this research, not just in, you know, managed retreat settings, but in lots of research, right? So racial ideologies in the US would suggest that equity is primarily or exclusively about communities of color. And so certainly in this field, communities of color are racially marked and thus present as ripe for more race-centered analysis in case study research, right? And that's sort of evident, that's important, especially when we think about these ties to the historical dynamics of racism and urban renewal and home ownership. But I would ask, is race operationalized quite as explicitly in case studies of white communities? Are we thinking about those communities as also racialized? Because they are. And so... One thing to keep in mind with this, right, is that 80 plus percent of human bots have taken place in white communities. That's a racial story. That's not just a story about class or place or risk tolerance and things like that. It's a story about race. And so managed retreat in the U.S. has been about the flow of public resources to white communities. Researchers need to examine how this unfolds. We need to study the racially powerful. Last slide here, just to reiterate that point, make the study of white communities about race 
assess whether retreat from white communities has a different character than retreat from communities of color. So these are some big picture questions that I look forward to discussing. Um, thank you so much. Hello, thank you for joining us. It is an honor to be here sharing and learning amongst so many interesting people. Um, I am Laura Dregarian. I'm a landscape architect and urban designer at Methune, which is an interdisciplinary design firm. Just working on advancing the slide. There we go, which is an interdisciplinary design firm with architects, landscape architects, urban designers, and interior designers across three West Coast offices. And before sharing collective work on behalf of Methune, I want to start with my own positionality and personal connection to this topic which started in 2011 with firsthand experience of the destructive Christchurch earthquake. And instead of rebuilding damaged utilities along the river, the city offered voluntary buyouts for over 5,000 homes. And years later, for my master's thesis exploring what I called emotional infrastructure, I went back and was intrigued to hear from people who once lived along the river about their dual experience of loss and optimism about what this new shared public open space amenity uh, had had brought the city. So I come to this from the privileged position of not having experienced this kind of unsettlement myself, but with an interest in how built environment professionals can support people emotionally as well as physically through disruption and place change. With my then colleague, Brad Barnett, I applied for an R&D grant at Methune to look specifically at flood related risk, relocation, and from an equity perspective, how managed retreat processes could prioritize the well being and self determination of disenfranchised communities. We interviewed practitioners and academics who have considered implementation, funding, and other aspects of managed retreat processes. And these interviews reinforce that although the most direct solution for flood hazard is a physical one, processes that don't explicitly address other dimensions of this issue can cause real harm, as we know. They can overlook social, emotional, and economic ties to place and community, perpetuate inequity through property-centric governance structures. They can be short-sighted, siloed, and at a mismatch scale to the need. The timing and allocation of funding can create a challenge when it doesn't support the full lifespan of the relocation process. And the negative connotation of retreat can preclude opportunities for multiple benefits. So we defined an equitable approach as one that considers hazard and harm together, supporting self-determination, reparations, and healing for those who experience flood risk as a result of past harms, like disinvestment, redlining, and land theft. To rethink through this lens, we shifted our language to focus on people over property. So where are people going? How are community priorities driving multi-benefit outcomes? And how can the process of community relocation maintain and strengthen connections and place attachments? This shift also prompted us to frame it as refuge over retreat to better express that safe and dignified housing can coexist with deep interconnected relationships between people, habitats, and water. Embedding equity into this process really relies on shifting economic incentives, insurance mechanisms, policy, and governance structures. And acknowledging that, we focused on what designers can uniquely offer this conversation, both to address the physical hazard and to redefine how this work can support communities that have endured harm in defining their own resilient futures. So first, addressing the physical hazard, we wondered what spatial opportunities exist beyond piecemeal property buyouts and dispersal of a community. Instead, we defined a spatial spectrum of possibilities that could allow those at risk to maintain attachments to place and community to the greatest extent possible. Some sites might offer the opportunity to move to higher ground within a single ownership boundary, which is the simplest from a regulatory perspective and would allow people to adapt while maintaining the connections they have. Resilience could be strengthened with additional strategies around water diversion and storage, landscape buffers, and energy infrastructure. At the incremental block scale, Neighbors on lower risk properties could be incentivized to develop infill housing for neighbors needing to relocate. Sending sites could then become places for stormwater and other community serving infrastructure. Again, this would help maintain connections while growing capacity at a block scale to deal with all kinds of shocks and stresses. This piecemeal approach would work well with the way that buyouts currently happen at a parcel by parcel level. Where flood vulnerability extends to an entire community, Lower risk public or underused land like a nearby park could be re-envisioned as a self-sufficient refuge for a neighborhood. Trading functions, the former neighborhood could then become a new floodable park. 
criteria for these receiving sites could be defined by the affected community. So things like proximity to jobs, transit access, and education facilities could be additional drivers. Ground leases, cooperative ownership, or other collective development arrangements could preserve public control of the land, but enable individual wealth creation, another important equity consideration. At this scale, the value proposition would need to be particularly clear to the receiving site neighbors and the broader community. Some receiving sites may allow for consolidation of both the existing function and new neighborhood. For example, an underused parking lot could provide refuge for community relocation while maintaining an ad adjacent commercial use. This leaves the sending neighborhood land available for a range of community serving possibilities like recreation, stormwater treatment, production, commemoration, restoration, et cetera. So these scales offer different opportunities in terms of spatial design and prompt different questions about equitable implementation. While none of them will solve Florida as generic concepts, they can support conversations as communities consider the full range of opportunities in their unique context. So now I'm gonna move into application of these spatial concepts via a collective visioning process that we're calling organizing refuge. This process allows communities that have endured harm to define for themselves what adaptation or relocation might look like. So I'm gonna step through each of these from building the strongest coalition to understanding risks and priorities, defining a collective vision, evaluating trade-offs and approach to testing the vision in context. But keep in mind that this process isn't actually linear and communities may jump to another part of the process in response to an event or may recalibrate as priorities change. Building the strongest coalition involves establishing trust before a specific project even exists. Ideally, this team includes public entities, community members, advocacy groups, tribes and First Nations, and design professionals, each bringing different expertise to the table. In addition to these groups, there's a range of people who can provide the much needed connective tissue, including artists, youth, historians, academic institutions, facilitators, etc. Having this wide range of expertise allows for rotating leadership depending on what's needed throughout the process. Once people are gathered, then comes establishing a common starting point, communicating the risks, defining the social and geographic extents of the affected community, not easy as Ciders mentioned, uh, understanding what the priorities of the community are, including what's loved about that place in its current form. Defining a collective vision then drives planning for multiple benefits, not just the physical, but also thinking about the aspirational, social, economic, ecological, and emotional conditions to be fostered. All of these inputs feed into what the right approach is to achieve that vision in that place, recognizing that there's a whole spectrum of options between adapting in place and wholesale relocation. So where do risk, cost, and ecology allow for adaptation? What are the priority improvements, partnerships, or co-benefits that support the vision? The value of the spatial spectrum is that it can act as a prompt for visualizing opportunities in context. What are the criteria for sending and receiving sites? What are the potentials for each? And where are the opportunities to align the vision with priorities of major funders? Representation of spatial opportunities can then support conversations with potential partners, funders, and regulators. One thing to highlight here is the need for funding streams to support pre-project coalition building and communication. On our projects, we've found that investing early in alignment between landowners, community organizations, designers, and policymakers sets up spatial visioning to be more meaningful and achievable. And in order to truly support self-determination, managed retreat also can't be the assumed approach from the beginning. An equitable process for this work has the same foundation regardless of where on the adaptation or relocation spectrum the project ultimately falls. So one recommendation is to create a funded position with a budget for an organizer or convener in equity priority communities to lead this initial work. The added benefit of this capacity building is that it doesn't expire at the end of a project, but it can support continued adaptation to other climate stressors even after relocation is complete. Just to emphasize that the groundwork for adapting in place is not distinct from that of relocation, I want to share an example of our work in North Richmond, California, an environmental justice community adjacent to a Chevron refinery with serious sea level rise and contamination challenges. This community decided to adapt in place by implementing a collaborative shoreline vision across multiple stakeholders and ownership boundaries. A co-design process has paid in an advisory group for their time and focused on how the infrastructure investment, living levy, could most benefit the community, including thinking specifically about what the community side of the levy can offer. 
Both the co-design process and integration of multiple benefits has helped position the project for funding at each step of the way. Early investment as uh, strategy partners with community leaders helped our team build trust, define what the projects might be, and help secure funding. Co-design has developed community champions and grown capacity to engage in continuous adaptation. As new challenges emerge, say sea level rise brings contamination issues to the forefront, priorities may change and the desired strategies may shift toward the relocation side of the spectrum. And if they do, the community will have the capacity to do something about it. One project where we did engage relocation was the Sea to City Design Challenge where the city of Vancouver, BC asked us to decolonize our design processes while envisioning a climate adapted future for False Creek out to 2100 and beyond. For us, this involved continuously questioning assumptions and working with a cultural consultant and knowledge keeper on our team to embed First Nations values in the process, language, and ultimate vision. Long-term, we envisioned an upzoned upland outside of low-lying fill with access to waterfront trails, marsh, beach, and mudflat habitat, and other spaces that really allow Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people to see themselves and their cultures represented in the landscape and take part in stewarding a restored shoreline. To make this dramatic shift, we thought about how the city might actually practice adaptation over time with different triggers defining the next step in an adaptation pathway. So really thinking about the full spatial and temporal spectrum that connects adaptation and relocation strategies. With our partners, One Architecture, our team evaluated what this would really mean in terms of lease lengths and material lifespans, when the buildings along the shoreline would begin to age out, as well as what kind of additional density the receiving upland site would require in order to house all those people. So we started with the density represented in city planning documents and layered onto that the additional density needed to accommodate adjacent neighbors. We also defined two nature-based adaptation pilot projects that could be implemented now to help move toward this vision. The habitat bench would buy a little bit more time intentionally providing only short-term protection before degrading and prompting the next phase of adaptation. And the forest berm would use topography as a plug where rising waters first moved inland, an adaptation for sheltered False Creek that wouldn't work in more exposed coastal locations. Cedar trees provide habitat and afford culturally relevant practices and storytelling. So in the context of sea to city, this is what refuge ultimately looked like. Art, visibility of host nations, sustainable buildings and materials, green stormwater infrastructure, transit, and outdoor spaces for walking, rolling, and gathering. So I want to conclude with this quote from Nikayla Jefferson. However fixed and unchangeable this world may seem, our rigidity is an illusion maintained only by us. I still have faith in our ability to dream of something different. I still believe that in my lifetime, we can change that we can co-create a culture grounded in empathy, care, justice, and respect for each other and earth. So to me, this really speaks to the great opportunity we have to engage in deep relational trust building work that's constantly being redefined to address new challenges and new priorities. So thank you all for listening. Thanks to so many people for contributing to this work and uh, excited to uh, talk more uh, throughout the week with you all. All right, let's see. Can you see my screen okay? Yep. <clears throat> okay. All right, am I good to go? Yep, go ahead. All right, thank you so much. 11 minutes left so i'll try to make this quick um a really a nice set of talks and um here um today i'll be talking about a nasa funded project a nasa equity and environmental uh, environmental justice project focused on um figuring out how to engage community and to partner and how to better position um fairly low capacity communities uh, to access funding, federal funding and family funding for adaptation buyouts and so on, um, and how to support flood mitigation in the in low low lying coastal communities that are um, primarily disadvantaged. 
So, so as we know, um, speaking for the majority of southeastern USA here, we, we have um, increasingly uh, difficult and um, untenable problems with flooding as well as um, sea level rise. And I'm not going to, to go into the details uh, other than to say that we are um, experiencing um, much more, much more flooding that is costing a lot more money. And uh, with sea level rise, um, not only are we expecting moderate flooding um, and bigger, bigger storm surges and, and tidal flooding to, uh, to occur, but um, we know from the literature that a, a majority of these this, of these impacts actually affect underserved and disadvantaged communities. So the focus of this talk is on adapting in place and adapting in place and protecting specifically um, through green infrastructure solutions to help mitigate some of the effects of flooding and sea level rise while also um, paying attention to, to the people, prosperity and overall sustainability of um, of, of our communities in place. So as we know, green infrastructure is a hybridized system that improves not only the ecological well-being of a community, but, uh, but pays special attention to societal and socioeconomic considerations. So again, it's a protection in place adaptation strategy that that has this, this these ranges of possible um, positive effects, um, and uh, that allows us to to know that even where managed retreat has already happened and where it's happening or it's in place, what happens with the remaining with the remaining parcels with the remaining areas that have been, have been bought out or have been retreated from. So um, with green infrastructure, one of the big uncertainties is around how, for whom, and to what extent do we implement these types of solutions um, to make sure that they meet the triad of, of protecting um, the economy, the ecology, and the people in place. So um, this, this project that I'll talk a little bit about today was um, specifically very much co-designed. So a lot of the speakers before talked about, you know, including the community, including policymakers, including um, your tribal and, and everybody else um, represented at the table. So we did, we, we, we designed the project from the ground up with three uh, partner communities. So these are all local um, governments and policymakers, uh, but at very different scales that operate um, different components of, of management and planning and resilience adaptation in, in this region. Um, and the interest to NASA was that we figure out ways to, to better leverage Earth observation data in thinking about environmental justice and equity, and in thinking about how to prioritize for um, equity and environmental justice. Um, so one of the big things that we wanted to be able to accomplish with this project is to show that we can work with community, with partner communities, help them um, tap into a lot of the federal funding that's being thrown, especially to states like North Carolina, where I'm, I'm speaking from, um, but help them do so in a, in a standardized and systematic way um, by, by implementing um, Earth observation data, cloud computing, repl replicable workflows, not only on the remote sensing um, side of things to prioritize green infrastructure potential solutions, but doing so um, by keeping in mind and trying to explore environmental justice dimensions um, and, and looking across chronically underserved communities from, from again, very analytical point of view. And then the third component of our project um, that is just beginning right now is um, to do to, to go back into the communities with the backing and with the understanding that we are working along um, policymakers in our local community um, throughout the entire duration to comments and, and prioritize potential solutions and implementation strategies. So to kind of give you an idea, we're in North Carolina, we are, um, um, an area of about 300,000 um, inhabitants, so not that large. But what's what's nice, or not nice, but kind of um, important about this area is that up to now, up to this project, we don't even have a resilience and adaptation plan in place. So the county and this larger this larger region that's made up of of, of a county, um, actually three counties, parts of three counties, um, several cities, um, and um, so, several have not necessarily come together to have a plan um, for resilience or, or adaptation moving forward. So this project is important, not only in helping the community come up with this plan and, and plan ahead and adapt, but also help them prioritize how to do so, because the question is always one of capacity. Everybody wants, right, and we've, and, and several speakers have, have talked about this, right, 
that we know there are a lot of disadvantaged and uh, um, EJ communities at recurrent risk from flooding. We have over 30 um, bought out properties that are already part of our analysis. We know that this area is extremely susceptible to not only hurricane and coastal flooding, but all, um, all sorts of riverine, pluvial and compound flooding. And, but the question always is, how do we prioritize not only who gets bought out and where to retreat from, but what happens with the properties and what happens with the land left over after that? So, so in doing so and trying to come up with a systematic prioritization approach, um, we actually use the double um, the Wilmington Metropolitan Planning Organization environmental justice index variables that have been um, selected through a lengthy community engagement process at this kind of regional scale of three counties. Um, and we have a listing here, um, everything from households living below the poverty line, density, um, minority representation, um, household incomes and disabilities, um, households with, with no vehicle and so on. And so what we did first is to design a methodology that, that computes an environmental EJ, um, an EJ um, vulnerability index, but at the block group level, which is not done, not done a whole lot, um, and not only do that, and don't worry so much about all the details, but because what's what's interesting here and hasn't really been done much at all before in the literature is to do so across um, essentially seven years of census data so that we can compute a chronic underserved um, index. So not only do we want to know, we know, well, policymakers and our local government know where the majority of our underserved communities are at any given time, but we wanted to be able to look statistically across um, the last 20 so years of census data, which we, we did, um, and look at the chronic underserved communities and, and use that as a potential uh, way of prioritizing. So, so in doing so, um, we, uh, we looked across the entire region, across these 20 years of, of block group level census data and identified um, our chronically underserved communities, which as you might imagine and guess to some extent, um, are downtown. So this is downtown city of Wilmington downtown. Um, that's where we would have expected that to, to have occurred. And that's exactly where um, the chronic EJ work um, showed that those, those communities exist. Now, um, with the approach that we took, which was a multi-scale um, geographically weighted regression, we looked at what the percent families living below the poverty line against the other remaining um, EJ variables that we considered in the study for the 20 years and now analyzed across seven specific years of census data. And we were able to show consistent, we were able to show consistently that um, across these variables of importance to, to the local planning committee for, for, for prioritizing EJ interventions and EJ communities, single-headed um, households um, in African-American communities um, are actually uh, the most significant predictors of where um, chronic underserved uh, communities are. So we are not only able to spatially identify what communities are, but what exactly of the variables considered make them um, underserved chronically um, for, for this time period. And so the second component was the leveraging of, of Earth observation data. And again, not going into all the details there, but we considered flood exposure and we're, we are considering a thousand year flood event, the flood depth and flood extent for a thousand year flood event. So we're, we're thinking way beyond the FEMA uh, special flood, um, flood hazard area delineations that, that most communities tend to still be plan, plan at. Um, and we computed a green infrastructure suitability index um, and, and essentially thinking about it uh, from a perspective of what could be implemented at the street level versus at the landscape level in order to protect and adapt in place. So ideas, uh, so examples of street level design options that we are considering in collaboration with our um, with our community partners are alternative planting, bioretention planners, um, bioswales, rain gardens, and um, dry retention basins. And, um, and then at the landscape level, um, we, we are considering um, a, a suite of options to slow and adapt and intercept some of that stormwater flow, some of that flooding um, for, for features that are larger than one attention bioswales, but larger than one acre, constructed wetlands, parking forests, water gardens, 
um, improved waterways and um, additional or improved pump stations, which we have a lot of living shorelines, um, and then a suite of, of much larger scale features such as external wetlands, marsh restoration, or marsh creation. And so to give you an idea of how that remote sensing data comes in now down to the level of, um, of these individual parcels. So what this map is showing is um, a suite of open parcels, available parcels. And these are they, these include um, existing 30 FEMA buyout properties that have already been bought out, in, as well as recreational parks, stormwater ponds, um, um, brownfields, um, educational facilities, um, and pu public schools, private schools, parks, and so so a range of of parcels that are available to be potentially um, leveraged for nature-based solutions and green infrastructure. Give you an idea if you look at this um, at the at the lens at the street level um, downtown here is where our EJ communities were all at. Obviously, there are very few opportunities when you go through this workflow to actually build or or implement something that is landscape level, a nature based or green infrastructure that's na that is landscape level that is able to protect or is able to leverage any of these existing open parcels uh, to to protect and place those communities. Um, and then if we look down at the street level for, for street features, and this is anything that's smaller than um, about um, 0.3 acres, we do see downtown here in our in our in our high EJ chronically um, underserved area. There are some opportunities, but these are very small opportunities. Um, and the, then that begs the question: Well, what exactly can be done? Because where the EJ chronically underserved communities exist, the opportunities to actually adapt in place and to actually um, utilize green infrastructure, even on the existing um, existing properties that are retreating, um, is very slim. Um, so the next stage for, for us here, though, is to now take all of this, the, the chronically underserved community data and the, the existing um, options for green infrastructure back to communities um, and, and conduct focus groups and community outreach sessions to feedback on that, understand the lived experiences with flooding for, for um, residents in these chronically underserved areas. And we've selected four areas um, in collaboration with um, advocacy, uh, local advocacy, advocacy groups um, and designers. Um, and um, we'll, we'll see if that actually allows us to, to better frame it and understand whether the community would be considering any of these green infrastructure options or whether they would prefer um, uh, alternative methods of dealing with the flood risk that they're recurrently exposed to. So, so again, it is all about bringing it all together collaboratively, but providing a process to systematically assess um, chronic, chronically underserved areas, as well as systematically create a framework that can be replicable, implemented using Google Earth Engine, which is a free platform, um, that any of our community partners here locally and beyond can utilize to actually start to, to, to zero in on where the, the opportunities for putting in protections in place and adaptations in place, such as green infrastructure even exist. Um, and so I'd like to thank NASA for our uh, ROSE's Equity and Environmental Justice Funding um, and our, our partners from, from the three partner communities that we've co-designed and, and are implementing this project with. Thank you.